Life in the Name of Jesus, a sermon delivered by Rev. Edgar Hillman III on April 7, 2013 at Central United Methodist Church in Asheville, North Carolina. I've had the privilege for a number of years to move about this region as a minister, and I have come to know very clearly that one of the most dynamic institutions that is serving the greater good in this whole region is a place called Givens Estates. And I'm kind of proud to say it's a, it's a United Methodist institution. And it, it also does my heart good to think that a, a lot of the uh, birthing of that great ministry started right here at Central. Some of the fine leaders of Central were some of the early visionaries that helped to really craft that ministry and to help it grow to what it is today. And we're privileged today uh, to have among us and to be our guest preacher this morning, the Reverend Ed Hillman. Uh, for a number of years now, I've, again, I feel privileged that I have been a friend and colleague, have been able to share with Ed and ministry. For 12 years, he served a church that uh, I love very much, that I served some years ago, the Fletcher United Methodist Church. And then after that, he was in First Methodist in Rutherfordton. And that's when an interesting call came his way to um, come and to serve as the director of ministries to, to Gibbons. And he serves really a, a, a campus that is much like this campus. They have a full ministry. Um, they're inv he's involved in preaching and pastoral care and the mission and outreach of Gibbons. You know, word gets around the conference when appointments are being made. It kind of filters its way down. You, you start hearing rumors of different appointments. And I remember not so many months ago, word came that it looked like Ed Hillman was going to be uh, appointed to Givens. And that, that did, I, I thought, you know, the Holy Spirit really can work in our cabinet once in a while. And they can make, I said, that's a good decision. They're, they're making a wonderful choice. And I think you'll know that even more clearly today. Um, Ed has a, a gift of being able to communicate the transcendent and the holy and the truths of our faith, and he has a wonderful ability to work with people. He's going to be talking today about um, non-judgmentalism. That's going to come up in the preach word today, and that's been so much a part of his ministry. I, I like seeing Ed move about his relationships and work with people. Um, people never get put in a box. He responds to everyone being full of promise and possibility. He's the kind of person we want to be in the place that he's at. And I'm so glad that Ed has come and welcome. So good to have you with us here today, Ed. Thanks, Rob. I, I have to say with an introduction like that, I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. I would bring you uh, greetings from the uh, staff and residents of Givens Estates, but so many of them are sitting out here that I think I'll just say, hi folks, how you doing? Um, after 21 months of serving as the Director of Ministries, I'm very happy to report to you uh, from the inside, uh, things are just as good as uh, they look like from the outside. It is a wonderful ministry, a very special place. I was down in Orlando at a conference a few weeks ago, and they kept talking about the happiest place on earth being the Magic Kingdom, and I kept feeling like I needed to uh, correct them in that. No, that's the second happiest place. Uh, Givens is truly a, a special place. Um, I have known uh, uh, the staff members there for about 18 years now, and uh, I have always been so impressed by them that when they invited me to join the staff, I was too flattered to refuse. It is a great place, and I'm very grateful that the bishop has appointed me there, and now I will try to hide for the rest of my ministry. This morning before, uh, before the first service, I, I looked in the hall there at the uh, gallery of preachers who have served here, uh, many of them very important in my own life. Uh, and I have to say it is somewhat uh, uh, intimidating to be the, uh, the guest preacher here with those uh, 
onlookers from the gallery. I am very much uh, uh, tempted to tell you everything that I know. And uh, luckily, 20 minutes will do it just about be enough time for that. I do want to say a word of thanks, though, as Rob said, for those that uh, worked hard to establish the Givens Estates and for those of you that continue to serve and support in that mission. And I also want to, uh, to say thank you for the Haywood Street mission. Uh, I think that that uh, ministry is a very important witness, uh, not just to our community, but beyond our community as well. And I believe that that spirit uh, embodies some of what I'm going to be uh, talking about this morning. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, breathe upon us once again and let us inhale deeply that you will give us your spirit of power that we may live life in your name. Amen. My text this morning is from that afternoon of the first Easter. The women have gone to the tomb. They have come back and reported to the disciples. And now later on in that first uh, day, we pick up the story. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met, were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, If you believe because you have seen me, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. After the terrible events of the weekend, the disciples are huddled together, not quite knowing what to make of the witness of the women. They are behind closed doors for fear of a group that John calls the Jews, uh, a tip that this was written a good while later because everyone there was Jewish. And Jesus suddenly appears among them and says, Peace be with you. 
He shows them his hands and his side. And the scripture says, then they were glad to see the Lord. Uh, there are those who haven't seen, and we'll get to them in just a moment. But first comes John's version of the Great Commission that we uh, know and have memorized from Matthew. Go therefore into all the world. But John says it in this way. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Hear and understand that. As the Father sent me, so I send you. This is not just uh, an admonition that they should follow some roadmap, some dogma, but an invitation that they be like him in the world. Now, many interpreters talk about the, the knowledge of God's will, the obedience to the divine will. So it seems to me a, a brief recap of the way Jesus lived is in order, uh, though we have very little of Jesus' life to go on, maybe three years. He did not seem to have many possessions and even warned against accruing too much. He was criticized for hanging out with the wrong sort of people. He even seems to have included women in his close circle of friends, which was odd back then. He was rather free with God's forgiveness. As a matter of fact, he was roundly criticized for that fact. Jesus himself was critical almost exclusively of those who celebrated their own righteousness. But the two most disturbing things of all to me were his insistence upon servanthood. Even to the point of just before he died, stripping off his clothes, getting down on the floor, taking the form of a house slave, and washing the feet of his disciples. One of his disciples said, that's a little too demeaning for you. And then also he insisted upon a love that you all know took him ultimately to the cross. A high school friend of mine emailed me not too long ago and said that she was praying for the success of my ministry. I wrote her back, I said, please don't do that. When your standard of success is death by crucifixion, you tend to thank God that you're not all that, that great. Uh, over 30 years of ministry as uh, uh, parishioners and other supporters have sometimes called me an incompetent boob straight to my face. I have bowed my head and said, thank you, Jesus, thank you. I find that it is difficult to be as Jesus was in this life. It really goes against my natural inclinations. Just as God breathed life into that first human being at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 2, so Jesus breathes new life of his spirit into those disciples. His Holy Spirit enables them, empowers them to go beyond their natural inclinations, to be a true community of love, of mercy, of forgiveness, of grace, just as he had been in the world. For the disciples to be the beginning of this new community, which Jesus likened to a family, mercy, grace, and forgiveness have not only to be the core values of that 
new family, but they have to be the constant mode of operation as well. The community has to stand on those values. Love one another just as I have loved you, he said. But then he said something that I am afraid has worked against us somewhat over these last 2,000 years. He said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. All my adult life, I have searched the scriptures to find where Jesus said, you must judge one another because it has been my experience and the experience of many as we look over the history of the church that way too much energy has been expended in trying to figure out who is in and who is out, forgiving some and retaining the sins of others. To have that tight control over that which we say is holy and that which is not, way too much energy over the last 2,000 years in doing that, and especially here in the South. Uh, we have a profound uh, investment in who is in and who is out. Bless their hearts, as we say. Uh, Jesus was criticized for being a little too free with forgiveness. You know, even more than that, in his table fellowship, uh, people criticized him for welcoming and eating with sinners because back then that was tantamount to social acceptance. That's how he was in the world. I laughed uh, the other day. I saw a bumper sticker on a car uh, of one of our Givens residents. It said, non-judgment day is coming. <laughs> I laughed and I thought, Jesus has gotten to somebody here. I was on a walk to Emmaus a few years ago. Have any of you been on, on a walk to Emmaus? A, a, a great experience. I'd, in, I'd encourage you to, uh, to make a walk if you haven't. Uh, the morning of the, the first full day, I, I had spent the, uh, the previous night listening to my brothers in our dormitory sawing logs as if with a chainsaw, so I didn't get a whole lot of sleep. I wasn't in a great humor. Uh, but they get us all together before breakfast on that first full day, and they read to us that wonderful story that I think we have misnamed the prodigal son. You know that story Jesus told about the, the two boys. The younger one, it's always the younger one, goes off and squanders half of his father's ancestral property in dissolute living. I love that phrase, dissolute living. And when everything fails him, when his money gone, his friends gone, he finds himself face down in the mud with the pigs. He comes back. He has a prepared speech. The father waves it off, tells him, you know, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the shoes. And he begins to celebrate. And uh, I wasn't favorably inclined to my brothers, and I was looking around them as this story is being read, wondering how many of them felt like uh, wastrels spending their lives in dissolute living. And I had one of those aha moments about what an insufferable jerk that older brother who does the right thing all the time really is. As Mark Twain would say, he's a good man in the worst sense of the way, of the meaning. And I realized that great affinity that I had with the older brother and how this story shouldn't be called the prodigal son because that's a little too obvious about who the sinner is. It should be called the tale of two lost boys. 
They say that uh, codependency, dysfunction in families, affects anywhere from 95 to 100 percent of families. And I think about this family. Uh, the older brother so resentful of this idiot father who has welcomed back this wasted son. And I wonder how this family is going to get along moving forward. At the end of chapter 9 in John's Gospel, Jesus says something interesting. For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And some of the good folks who were standing there heard Jesus and said, you don't mean we're blind, do you? And he said words to the effect, if you only knew how blind you really are, it'd be a lot easier to forgive you. History has proven that we are never so blind as when we refuse to see. Those are the folks, quite frankly, who retain their own sins. Now let us get to the doubters. Do we have any doubters in the congregation this morning? Any doubt at all? A couple of ministers down here. Anyone else? Well, at least I don't feel alone. All right. Uh, we call Thomas the, uh, the doubter. Uh, I love the, the beautiful stained glass here of, of Jesus uh, appearing to Mary uh, that morning. She runs back. She tells the disciples, and you probably remember the story, only two of them can stir themselves to get up and go check it out. Uh, one of them believes, the other just wonders. The rest of them, as Luke reports it, just think of this as an idle tale. And yet we call Thomas uh, the doubter. Uh, I call Thomas the first modern man. The first modern man. Thomas is one of those folks who is not going to believe something is so just because other people tell him that. As a matter of fact, how many of you have heard in the last few years that if something sounds too good to be true, it probably isn't. Anyone heard that? Financial advisors love to tell people that too. Thomas is properly skeptical. Clearly that first Sunday of Easter in John's Gospel, Jesus had finished what he came to do in his resurrection, in his breathing on them and sending them out. But Thomas wasn't there, one person. And it was necessary that Thomas see. Because my brothers and sisters, seeing really is believing. Can I get an amen? Okay. Seeing is believing. It's something we say even to this day. Jesus does give a superior position to those who believe even though they haven't seen. And yet the experience of the risen Christ is still absolutely necessary. Do you know what the fastest growing religious group is in this country? You know, I asked the group uh, last night, some of them said uh, Islam, that was a good guess, but no. Mormonism, another good guess, but no. Some uh, uh, conservative type uh, evangelical group, again, a great guess, but no. About six years ago, the, uh, the Barna group that studies religion in America did their big uh, survey and they found out, and that's recently, more recently even been confirmed, 
that the fastest growing religious group in America is, wait for it, none of the above. None of the above. As more and more people do not want to be associated with those religious folk. Do you know why? In a sense, we are victims of our own success. We have so effectively spread the good news of Jesus Christ that most people in this culture know exactly who he is. It's just that they don't see him. They don't see him anymore. They see a church that is very interested in retaining the sins of others. They see a church that claims too much, overreaches all the time. They see a church that is much more interested in regulating who is in and who is out. And they know that Jesus wasn't like that. Every generation, someone will tell you, it's a critical time in the life of the world. But I really believe that it is. I really believe that it is. I don't want a tipping point to come where people will no longer associate with religion because the world will not make it without Jesus. The world will not make it without his self-sacrificing love. The world will not make it without forgiveness, mercy, compassion, love. And the world has to see that. We need a new Easter, a new breathing of the spirit of Jesus in and out of all of us. That's why I'm so thrilled when I see things like the Haywood Street Congregation. <laughs> Anyone is welcome there, no matter where they've been, no matter who they are. And that's who Jesus was. And people can see that now. And they can come. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> breathe in. Breathe out very deeply the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ and let us be about the welcoming, the forgiving, the community of love and grace and mercy. Lord Jesus, breathe upon us and cause us to inhale deeply. Be in every fiber of our beings. Let us lay aside our preoccupations with who is acceptable and who is not, and simply be agents of your love, your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness. Send us out once again to live life in your name. Amen.